Hi, my name is Chelsea Christensen and I'm going to go over an inhalation pediatric induction. So, um, first thing, before the patient comes into the room, I'm going to come in and check that I have all the monitors that I need, do a machine check, check that I have suction um, that's working and on. I have all my airway supplies for pediatric oral airways. Um, a Mac and a Miller blade, I am going to have a Mac size 2, a Miller size 1. Um, I'm going to have the appropriate ET tube size, and for this patient, and they are going to be 5 years old. So we're going to take the age, uh, plus 16, divide that by 4, that gives us a size 5 ET tube. Um, and then I have tubes in each direction, just in case. Um, for tube depth, we're going to take that 5 and times it by 3, so our tube depth for this patient, patient is going to be 15. Um, and then I have my IV meds drawn up, ready to go, and I have my Apple's emergency meds drawn up on my other cart, ready just in case. So, for this patient, um, he's going to come into the room. We're going to say this patient is cooperative, so we're going to lay them down on the bed. We may put a shoulder roll under just to help with some positioning, put their head in a little bit of a sniffing position. We're going to take our mask and we're going to use the CE technique. So we're going to hold with our thumb and forefinger, holding the mask to their face with our other three fingers. We're going to hold the bony part of the jaw and pull that up towards the mask. Um, while we're doing this, our settings for our nitrous and oxygen. Nitrous is going to be at seven liters. Oxygen is going to be at three liters. And because this patient is nice and cooperative, we are going to slowly turn up our SIBO and two to four to six, um, whatever we need up to eight until this patient is asleep. If the patient is in cooperative, then we will still have our nitrous at seven, our oxygen at three, um, but now we are going to just crank up our SIVO to eight and hold on for the ride. So how we know that we are doing the inhalation induction that the patient is actually getting the gas is we can look at our monitor, see that our tidal volumes are there, um, check that our end tidal is there, the patient's not holding their breath, they are breathing in the gas, so they will go to sleep. Um, when we do these inductions, we go through stage two, which is the excitation stage. Um, this stage can be um, where the patient is at risk of laryngospasm, um, if the patient does laryngospasm, we can do a couple things to try to help that. First off, we would know because they're no longer pulling air, um, our tidal volume's dropped, our end tidal is gone. So what we can do first is we close our APL valve to 70. We apply a constant pressure on our bag, um, giving positive pressure to the airway to try to break that. If that doesn't work, we can try more gas uh, sedation. Um, this patient doesn't have an IV, so we may go straight to succinylcholine, uh, paralytic to try to help with that. The doses for that um, would be if we had IV, one to two milligrams per kg. If we had to do IM, two, it would be three to four milligrams per kg. Um, anytime you give succinylcholine, you should also give atropine to a child because it can cause them to go bradycardic. So atropine dose would be a minimum of 0.1 one milligrams, um, dosing is 0 0.02 milligrams per kg, um, and yeah, so patient is going well, we are going through stage two, so we're holding on, patient is having some uncontrolled muscle movements, um, if we looked at their eyes, they would have a, a disconduit gaze, um, they may kind of start fighting us a little more, their blood pressure might, might go up, be a little tachycardic, we just hold on to get through this stage. Um, once the patient starts to calm down, their respirations go into more of a regular pattern, we know we are getting into stage three, surgical anesthesia, where we want to be. So now we can put in an IV um, and proceed with our uh, direct laryngoscope. So nurse is going to put in an IV. The IV is in great. Thank you. Now I have my meds. Um, for this patient, I am going to give two to three milligrams per kick of propofol, uh, fentanyl, 50 milligrams. Um, for Zofran, I'm going to give 
0.1 milligrams per kick. And then decadron, I'm going to do 0 0.0625 to 0 0.15. Um, so now meds are in, patient is asleep. We are going to turn off our gas and our nitro so we don't gas the room. And we are going to get ready to do our intubation. So I am going to use the Miller blade, a little less tongue control but you can get the epiglottis with this one. And I visualize the cords. Visualize the tube going through the cord to a depth of 15. We are good. Now I am going to make sure that the tube is in the right place. I would push on the child's chest. You can kind of see a little misting in the tube. Um, and then you can also go to the room of breath, see some chest rise, use your stethoscope, listen on axillary, axillary, and epigastric. Um, everything sounds good. If you had a cuff tube, put some air in that and tape it onto the face. Now that our tube is in, um, we can talk about some other things that might happen. So there's always a risk of bronchospasm during the case, which is in the lungs. You would see this by a high pressure alarm. Tidal volumes would drop um, and you would have no more uh, end tidal. So first you could check your tube, make sure your tube is not kinked in the right place. Um, then you could look to make sure there's no cardiac involvement. If there is cardiac involvement, this is probably an anaphylactic reaction. We would turn off our gas um, and we would give one mic uh, per kilogram of epi. Um, if we don't think it's cardiac involvement, then we would um, try a beta 2 agonist so we can squirt that into the lungs. Um, we can do methylprednisone or an anticholinergic like hypotropium. Um, if those don't work, um, some other things during the case, um, kids are, kids can go bradycardic if they get hypoxic. So if this happens, um, you can give one mic per kick of epi and follow the PALS algorithm if needed um, and correct the hypoxia. So now our patient is, the case is done. We are thinking about extubation. There are two things we can do. We can either do an awake extubation or a deep extubation with an awake extubation. Um, the patient will have their airway reflexes intact, um, but they are at risk of bleeding, um, increased ICP, they're gonna fight the tube, they're gonna wake up grumpy, it's gonna, it may be a little bit more of a rough go. But if we do RSI, we have to do an awake extubation. But our patient did great. We are going to do a deep extubation, so we want our patient to be at a MAC or deeper, um, no reactions. Um, first, we're going to suction out the patient and make sure they don't have a cough or gag. As long as we don't have a cough or gag, then we know our airway reflexes are still diminished. Um, so we first will check that our tidal volumes are good enough. Um, this patient is reaching great tidal volumes, six to eight mils per kick. Um, they're breathing spontaneously, so we are good to pull the tube out. So we will pull the tube out of this patient and move over to max ventilate. Um, and as the patient goes through stage two again as they wake up, they are at risk again for laryngospasm, um, bronchospasm, all that stuff. So always just keep that in your mind and the patient is good to go to vacuum.